This is Freedom Investor Radio, and I'm John Pearl. It hit me like a freight train when I realized there was a better way. When I discovered that I could take my future into my own hands. When I realized I could invest my way to freedom. This is what I'm working towards. In each episode of Freedom Investor Radio, we will explore the tactics and strategies used by the top real estate investors and entrepreneurs in the nation. We will learn how you can start investing your way to freedom and take control of your life. Thanks so much for tuning in. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Freedom Investor Radio. I'm your host, John Pearl. Today, we're joined by Hunter Thompson, Managing Principal at ASIM Capital and host of the Cashflow Connections Real Estate Podcast. Hunter, welcome to the show, my man. Honor to be on. Awesome. All right, Hunter, I'm going to pass it over to you. Why don't you tell us what you do now, how you got there, what you're all about? So I am, like you said, the principal of ASIM Capital, which is a private equity company, and we act kind of as a uh, sponsor, allocator, and aggregator. So over the last 10 years, I have been an investor in real estate and have uh, you know, started in the space in a very passive manner, just trying to get my money out of the stock market, trying to get my mom's money out of the my sister's money. I was just like, we have to find more predictable ways of creating favorable returns. And real estate is kind of by far and away the best way to do that. And I can take some data points to justify that in today's climate. But um, I build up some very powerful relationships with some great people. And then basically we curate opportunities for our investors. Uh, we've purchased around $150 million worth of real estate, placed around 50 million or 60 million of equity and across mobile home parks, self storage office, industrial, Bitcoin mining, ATM funds, et cetera. And the reason we're able to do that is not that I'm a, a jack of all trades. We're just very good at finding these deals with a focus on finding sponsors that have significant market advantage. So uh, that's what we do. Um, as far as my background, I am like a big believer in viewing the world of investments through economics and kind of had my last straw moment with the stock market in 2010 when the European debt crisis took place. And people don't talk about that a lot. For me, I was just like, how the heck is my whole net worth being uh, intraday swings of like, you know, 200 basis points based on the Greece bond yields and the German bond yields? I could have never predicted that, even if I had a team of Stanford grads. They would have never predicted that. And I don't have a team of Stanford grads. I got to find something that's predictable and can produce, you know, favorable outcomes with high cash flow. And it's not that I'm just married to real estate. It's just that that's the most effective way to do that consistently. That's great. So on the topic of macroeconomics, understand you have a summit coming up, the 100K to Invest Summit, which will be uh, roughly a month from now, which I'm extremely excited about. Can you tell us a little bit about that? That's right. So depending on when this is released, I mean, whatever, go there right now. 100K, the number 100K to invest.com. It's a free summit. You should totally do the upgrade though. But here's the principle. Um, everyone is asking questions about economics and how this impacts real estate right now. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, the yield curve recently inverted the 10 and the two year inflation is kicking up. Interest rates are rising. People are concerned about regulatory changes because of the potential for challenges with inflation. The misery index is coming up. And I wanted to ask 22 different experts in different niches, what are your favorite investment vehicles right now? And how do you view them in this current economic environment? And the sessions, I mean, I was just really blown away. We talked about, like I said, Bitcoin mining, mobile home parks, self storage, RV investing and buying existing businesses and looking at each of these opportunities in today's climate. And so it's a really cool summit. And like I said, check it out at 100k to invest.com. Excellent. So you mentioned the yield curve, Hunter. Can you give us a quick overview, maybe for those kind of at a beginner level of what exactly it is, why it's important, what's happening right now with the yield curve, and what does it mean for real estate investors? So this is actually a, a pretty interesting kind of thing. And people talk about this all the time, but maybe don't provide enough detail to make it actually make sense. So at least that was for me for a long time. People would say, oh, it's the yield curve inversion. It's like, okay, cool. I don't know what that means, but I just say, hey, it's not good. Well, uh, let's try to break it down just a little bit. So in normal economic times, uh, the yield curve or yield, bond yield slope up and to the right. And meaning that if you think about the X and the Y axis with the, the X axis being time 
Is that right? <laughs> yeah, the XS being time and Y axis being yield. Um, the longer the duration of the time, the higher the yield should be because the investor is incurring the time risk about when they're going to return their money back. And so you would want a higher return the longer you would go. Okay, so it slopes up and to the right. But every now and then an economic phenomenon takes place, which is that this, the shorter term bond yields invert, basically, where you can get a higher return for investing in shorter term bonds uh, than longer term bonds. And the one that most people focus on, most economists focus on, is the 10 year and the two year. And that inversion recently took place. And that's typically a sign of a recession. It means there's so much fear in the marketplace that people are concerned about the short-term risk. And so what ends up happening is that it is a predictor of recessions. People start thinking that there's going to be a recession. To some degree, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And generally speaking, 18 to 22 months after that inversion takes place, there's typically a recession. But uh, that does not mean that it's a time to sell. And in, in, in real estate, you know, typically recessions in real estate aren't really linked. You know, going back and looking at the data for decades, in order for there to be like a 15% correction in real estate prices, that is a wildly ahistoric figure. That is like a once every several decade type of number. And I do not think we're on the verge of one of those moments. And I can give you a couple of data points to justify why. Yeah, so I, I was just recently reading through, so Marcus and Millichap just released their 2022 Q2 reports. Uh, many of the uh, strong multifamily markets, so it's showing vacancies are low and lowering. Demand for affordable housing is high, not, a new, not enough new construction to keep up with demand. And it, it seems like the multifamily market in particular is still performing strongly. What is it, in your opinion, looking like with, you see interest rates rising, which could potentially mean cap rates are going to go up as well. Uh, what, are you, what are you seeing in that context looking forward? So let's talk about interest rates rising, because unlike the yield curve inverting, which could be an indicator for recession, interest rates rising is not some indicator. It's happening, right? So we need to be knowledgeable about that. And uh, I know you and I have been in some meetings recently where some very active owners have had $40 million deals that have fallen out of escrow because of this. And so this is something that we need to know about and understand and be knowledgeable about in the marketplace. So, but we have to put it in perspective. So going back just a little bit, uh, in 2008, the central bank in the United States made, from my perspective, the decision to open up the Pandora's box of significant hundred million dollar, hundred billion dollar, trillion dollar quantitative easing. And they basically indicated to the market, if something goes wrong or there's a catastrophe or there could be a catastrophe, we're going to smash this button. And that then was proven to be accurate in 2020, where not only did they smash the button, you know, they basically broke the button, you know, over the last 24 months, central banks all around the world printed a total of about $10 trillion. And so that trillion, those trillions of dollars have created this massive tsunami of liquidity, which is slushing around the financial markets, searching for yield. And when that happens, equity valuations increase, the multiple on which equities are traded, including real estate increases, but consumer prices increase as well. And that's what most people refer to as inflation. Now, I don't want to go too much of a tangent, but I got to just make this point clear. I'm a proponent of the Austrian School of Economics. And the way that Austrians define, economic, define inflation is that the increasing of the money supply. It has nothing to do necessarily with prices. But most people discuss this in terms of prices. And I'll, I'll tell you why that's important. If an apple is $5 and there's a massive 2008 style recession, and the central bank prints a bajillion dollars and apples remain $5. I think most people would say there's no inflation in the Apple market because the prices didn't increase. But Austrians would make the argument, no, there necessarily was inflation because of this massive increase in the money supply. And the implication is perhaps apples would have been $1 had it not been for that massive increase in the money supply. But the money printing has you know, basically 
given a mixed signal to consumers that prices of apples have remained the same. No one's in a position to complain, blah, blah, blah. But that's not what's happening now. Regardless of what your definition of inflation is, it's cranking along at a significant multi-decade high. But what this means to real estate is very different than what this means to consumers. Real estate owners are massive benefactors of this economic reality. Here's why. Not only did the multiplication of that income increase, the net income also increases as a result of inflation. So if I have a multifamily apartment and after I've implemented the business plan, I anticipate that rents will increase at the rate of inflation, no more, no less, just the rate of inflation, just to be conservative. I would also underwrite that expenses would increase at the rate of inflation. That's to be conservative, right? We're tracking along. If it's 5%, 6%, 7%, we're assuming rental income and all income and also expenses will track along at the same exact rate. I think most people would hear that and think, okay, it's a wash in terms of the net, right? But that would be the case only if it was a one-to-one -one ratio of income to expenses, but it's not. Most of the product types we trade, let's say multifamily apartments, self-storage in particular, you can see a 70-30 ratio between income and expenses, meaning that the, top, the, the bottom line is going to grow significantly because it's disproportionately weighted towards income. Does that make sense before I go any further? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, definitely. So that's two pieces of the inflation story, but there's a third piece that doesn't get nearly enough attention that is like the ultimate X factor in this game. If the Fed's going to play this game, which they clearly are, which is what happens to the debt that you borrow in this inflationary environment. If I buy a $15 million property and put $5 million down and borrow $10 million, the purchase power of that $10 million, the money I have to pay back to the bank in purchase price power is being eroded massively the higher inflation is. Meaning that over a 10-year period, if inflation is in fact at 8%, the purchasing power of that $10 million is cut in half by the end of the 10-year period. So banks are literally paying you to buy an asset which will likely increase based on the multiplier of income increasing, the income itself increasing, and the purchasing power of the borrowed money significantly decreasing or being cut in half during the 10-year period. This is potentially creating a back-the-truck-up moment for real estate investors without even getting into the insane supply and demand disequilibrium of housing in the United States. Yes. So you brought up a lot of good points there. And one thing I want to I want to hammer down on a little bit is inflation and kind of how during inflationary periods is when the wealth gap increases between those who own hard assets and those that don't, those who are on a fixed income. So let's talk about uh, purchasing power. And let's say, let's say maybe for someone uh, who's on a fixed income, what are some ways that they can take their current capital and, and kind of ride this wave of inflation versus just relying on their fixed income? Dude, good question. So, I mean, first of all, I'll just do a quick anecdote or whatever caveat, which is like, this podcast isn't about what government should and shouldn't do. I've done a bajillion podcasts about that. It didn't make me very much money, by the way. But I don't want listeners of the show to be on the losing side of the rich get richer, the poor get poorer game. And so I recognize how the game is played and I want to own assets that at least will hedge against inflation, if not massively benefit when this game is played out the way this is. So if you're sitting on the sidelines and you're in cash, my view is that that is not a conservative approach to protecting your wealth. I don't know what to describe that strategy, but it's not conservative. I mean, conservative is not the way that you're, it's not going to work. It's not going to conserve anything. It's going to get hammered by this game and the way the political incentives are set up. So it's very important to own assets, which are going to do the things that I just outlined. So look, if you're new to this space and you're interested in getting into investing, I would not go and start investing right now. What I would do is go absolutely all in on education. John, you put out a lot of great content. Your listeners are getting more and more educated, but it's like, just go absolutely crazy. Like go down the John rabbit hole. If you're a fan of his until you have no more content digest and then reach out to him for a one-on-one -on -one call, tell him everything you've learned and ask him what the next step is. 
Like that's how this game is played. Go from mentor to mentor, constantly leveling up, hitting a ceiling, and then asking for a favor. And that would be my suggestion. Like if you are currently not investing in real estate, now is a perfect time to go in, all in on education. Real quick caveat to that caveat, which is this. While I'm here saying this is a back the truck up moment, it is based on where I am with my confidence, my career, my network, my net worth, et cetera. It was a back to truck up moment in 2010, but I was not there yet. I, I was only going in on education at the time, but this game works all the time. So you're never going to miss this once of a lifetime opportunity in real estate because that's the whole point, but it is important to participate. So go all in on it. Absolutely. So I want to talk about debt again. You brought up debt earlier and debt during inflation, how to use it to our advantage. So regarding money borrowing and interest rates, what about what about homeowners right now? I know a lot of people who are refinancing into a 15-year loan, kind of the Dave, Dave Ramsey crowd. They want to pay it off quicker. Uh, oh, yeah. Just, just own it outright. But what about what about leveraging the debt and the amount of inflation? So, you know, they say we're at like, what, 8% CPI, but really it's, it's a lot more than that. You touched on that a little bit earlier, but people say people are getting scared. Interest rates are going up 5%, maybe 6% here in the near future, but that's yeah. really not that bad compared to where we're at with inflation. How can we use that to our advantage? Okay. So you just touched on something. Well, let's put some data on it. I mentioned this kind of candidly previously, but like, let's state what it actually means. If inflation is at 8% and interest rates are at 5%, interest rates are net negative in real adjusted terms. That's insane. Like if we, if we agree with the government data and say that 8% is an accurate figure, that means the banks will pay you 3% per year to borrow money. <laughs> that is a wild, wild situation. So the Dave Ramsey crew might be right for them, but let's not make the argument that it's based on sound financial arithmetic. Does that make sense? Like, I don't know your personal situation. Uh, one of my great mentors, I'm not going to say their name, but you can do your own research to figure it out. And he is emotionally tied to buying a house in cash, a nice house, by the way, in a state where it's very expensive to buy a house because the emotional component for him is worth the arithmetic of what that would imply. So I don't know like your situation, the way that you account for things might be slightly different than mine. However, if I'm going to play just significantly the math of this, I want to borrow as much as possible for as little as possible. And my term will be as long as possible. All right. So I was at a conference once and this guy, Clyde, I forget his last name right now, financial freedom principles. Uh, he's just an old school guy that probably has just a net worth that would just be eye-watering to any of us. And he, but he just comes off as like the old boy that, you know, $8,000 car, like just that you would never expect. He does his own negotiation because, Hey, look, I can't make this mobile home park work. Cause like the manager doesn't have three grand to come up with the down payment. He gets these zero down. Anyway, he's a complete savage when it comes to this stuff. He has gotten multiple hundred year loans and he's 80. And so he asked in this audience, like, why do I get these hundred year loans? <laughs> and someone next to me raised their hand and goes, because he's a young guy. <laughs> like, no, it has nothing to do with his age. It has to do with the fact of the time value of money. The longer I can extend out the term, when do I want to get paid now? When do I want to pay you? Never. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I'll settle for slightly less than never. So um, it may be the case that you want to get a 15 year mortgage because you want to accomplish this lifetime goal of owning your house in cash by the time you're 60. But that is a premium you're paying for that emotional component. And I'm not against these things. I don't know that owning a house is the best thing to do in today's environment, but my wife wants to own a house. So believe me, we're going to buy a house. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. So you, you brought up some data points. I want to talk about some more data points that I've heard in some of your recent content. So household net worth, all-time high, increased by 20% in 2020. Income per person increased significantly over the past couple of years. Household debt service debt service payments as a percentage of personal income is at a 40 year low, but consumer sentiment is low. What is yeah. the deal? What's going on? Okay. So real quick, just to circle back on that. So net worth, all time highs or, or significantly all time highs, household per income, close to all time highs, significant increases just since these money printing things have been taking place. Um, 
but debt service is at a 40 year low, meaning that you could hear those other things and think, oh, maybe everyone's just leveraged to the moon. This isn't really indicative of a healthy economy or healthy consumer. But the reality is given where interest rates are, despite all this chatter, you still have a 40 year low in debt service payments, at least. Yeah, it's still 40 year low based on the last time I checked. So what this means is that the consumer is not happy, not because of their financial position, but because of you know narratives in the media, uh, price of energy, which is really, really uh, like the number one thing where you get this misery index number getting up pretty high. Um, the price of energy is something that really does impact the consumer to a large degree. So that's not like just media narrative, that's real. But I personally think um, that, that there's some short-term things going on there that I think will relax that. And if that energy problem was solved, for example, I think that the, the consumer sentiment thing would be low. By the way, historically speaking, consumer sentiment is not a good indicator of where we are on the market. In fact, very much the opposite. Like everyone knows this, you know, even as a capital raiser, it's far easier to raise money at all time highs than it is at lows. That's the nature. That's why it's, that's why they're at their lows. You know what I mean? So um, we can't rely on them to predict market timing, but it is important because 70% of the economy in the United States is based on consumers. So we got to know about it, but their balance sheet across multiple income segments is very well protected where we currently are with debt and interest rates. Yeah. So you mentioned, you mentioned something that kind of strikes a chord with me, the media. Now I do my best to avoid the media. And I think it's more important than ever to avoid the media whatever it is that you follow and focus on specific uh, alternate forms of media and information. But you know I, what? You know, Can I interrupt real yeah, quick? Absolutely. So um, I'm a big fan of Dave Smith. I'm a big fan of Michael Malice. They kind of popularized the term recently called the corporate press because that's the reality of the situation. The alternative media is no longer alternative. The Joe Rogan show is 20 times bigger than the most popular show on any of these cable news networks. And they try to make him seem like the outlier in a crazy uh, you know, uh, fringe. No, like they're the fringe to a large degree. Um, so the corporate press has different agenda and everyone else is just kind of going about their business, but go ahead. No, absolutely. That's, I couldn't agree more. And what I'm getting at is it does no good. It, it just distracts you. So over the past couple of years, since I've started my journey in real estate investing, it's been two times, two significant events, the, the beginning of COVID and the, the outbreak of the Russia Ukraine war just recently. I find myself just glued to the TV. And what does that do to me? It completely sidetracks me and throws off my mindset. And I just kind of forget about what I'm doing as far as my, my wealth building goals. So more than ever, it's important to just stay tunnel vision and focus on what your goals are financially and what you got to do to, to gain your freedom. Anyways, uh, one more topic I want to touch on, just kind of the, the larger scale macro environment on a, on a worldwide scale. So mentioned the, the war in Ukraine, been ongoing for two months, massive supply chain issues around the world, crazy gas prices, $6 trillion introduced into the U.S. economy in the past two years. And I believe we're at up to about $10 trillion worldwide right now. Something like that, yes. Yeah. As a passive investor, what's your one piece of advice to, you know, looking, looking at passive investment op opportunities? What's something, uh, one piece of advice you'd offer to folks in this climate? Well, yeah, totally. So, I mean, I have a pretty boring approach because it doesn't matter where we are in the cycle. My thesis is the same, but the percentages might change. So, you know, in 2014, I thought the mobile home park business was by far and away the most favorable risk adjusted returns you could find in the United States. You could find 10% cap rates while multifamily apartments were trading at 6% cap rates back then. But since then, not because of me, <laughs> I tried to be as loud as I could as always, but um, that Delta, which was 400 basis points is now compressed to like 50 basis points, meaning you can buy a property in uh, you know, Austin for a 3.5% cap rate. You can buy a, a mobile home park nearby at a 4% cap rate. So that Delta has shifted so much that I think on a risk adjusted basis, perhaps now multifamily apartments, well, clearly, regardless of what you think in that scenario, all things being equal, multifamily would necessarily be more favorable than it was in 2014, just proportionately. That doesn't mean it's always a great investment, but I change my allocations based on those changing dynamics. And that would be just one of many examples. Um, I also think that 
Bitcoin mining right now is a great way to get exposure to the space without necessarily holding too much crypto. Some people like want to hold crypto, some people don't, but everybody missed the boat on crypto. Even if you have $100 million of Bitcoin, don't you wish you had a lot more? Like certainly you would have if you thought if this was going to happen. So you, you, it's not too late to participate in Bitcoin mining. I mean, you can get exposure to the space, depreciation, cash flow, and still, you know, get your distributions in cash or Bitcoin. I mean, that's just a great way to participate in the space. So it's pretty cool. And how, if somebody was interested in participating in a Bitcoin mining uh, fund, for example, you've got one, how could somebody get involved with that? Yeah, so we, um, you can learn all about our investments at asimcapital.com. And I'll just do a quick disclaimer. I'm a registered representative. I raise money uh, professionally, and you can learn all about that, including form CRS on our website. So yeah, just go there. Excellent. Uh, one question that just popped into my mind that, you know, with all of this macro talk and inflation, is this just a new normal that we're going to see? It's, is it ever going to go back? Like house prices, we're both on, both in California right now. I grew up in the Bay Area. My parents purchased our house for, you know, 100K in the late 80s. It's worth 2 million now. And, awesome. you know, other areas of the country, Knoxville, we both went to the University of Tennessee That's and right. Knoxville prices. When I started college there, you know, under 100K. Now they seem to be averaging up in the 400Ks, like, and, and in the commercial real estate sector as well. Is this just the new normal we're dealing with? Is it ever going to return? What, what are your thoughts? Dude, I mean, I think we're going the route of Japan. I think we're going to see, I mean, looking at the bond market in Japan right now, we've got two year government bond yield is a, ooh, eye watering negative 0.06%. We got the five year bond at 0.01%. We've got the 30 year bond at 0.98%. And the reason that this happens is that Japan has their own central bank. And so do we. And so the argument that I've tried to make for quite some time is that this can go along far longer than I think. And then my fellow Austrians think as well, especially if you have your own central bank and geez, Japan is not the, U they are not the global currency. They're not the global reserve currency. So like for all the things that Japan has going for it, we have a lot more going for us. So the story can go along a lot longer for us than Japan, in my personal opinion, very smart people disagree with me, by the way, but you know, Japan's debt to GDP ratio is somewhere in the range of 300%. Ours is somewhere in the range of 140%. It's been a while since I've checked the number, but something close to that. It's probably not even that. I'll look it up real quick while we're talking, but that can, that is a really important data point. Like there are some people that view Japan as like they have unlocked this new way to never deal with 10% unemployment again. It's like a permanent low growth recession but you never have the political pushback of what happens when you have 15% of the people unemployed. So I think that's the future. I mean, think about it like this. The government made it illegal to work in 2020 and everyone's income went up. If you're a politician, aren't you thinking like, well, clearly that's going to happen every time something bad. I mean, they have the button. They can't unpush the button and there's no other button. I mean, technically they could say, we're going to reduce, <laughs> we're going to increase the amount of reserves each lending institution has to have, push that button, but that's never going to happen. And the interest rate button is the other button and the quantitative tightening button is the other button. But the only reason these buttons even exist is so they can push the other buttons, the printing, low interest rate, permanent, uh, you know, unemployment benefits. Every incentive I can think of is weighted towards those buttons. So we'll see how it plays out. But I'm going to anticipate that this is going to go on until it can't. Not until Volcker comes back from the grave and goes, get buckle up, everyone, 15% interest rates. Yeah, I'm with you on that. And you, you know, you've mentioned Austrian economics a couple of times. I'm a big fan of that as well. Educating myself about Bitcoin has kind of got me into that. If anybody wants to learn more about Austrian economics, Mises Institute, Mises, M I S E S dot org is a great, great place to learn about it. And uh, Hunter, I got one more question for you. I ask all my guests a um, little bit of background. I work at a nuclear power plant, and my goal is to replace my W 2 income with income from real estate investing by 2025. Power plants shutting down. So, what's your one piece of advice? for folks like me who are in, in a space where they need to leave their job or want to leave their job in the next couple of years, what would you tell folks like us? Dude, this is such a cool story, dude. I hope you continue to like harp on what you just outlined. Cause it's like, 
ah, there's no better way to like raise the stakes and shorten the timeline than to actually have a real timeline. And that's just awesome. So can you ask the question one more time? I got sidetracked. Yeah, looking for one piece of advice, you knowing what you know, what would you offer to folks like us who are looking to escape the W2 world through investing through passive cash flow? Yeah. Don't figure, don't try to do this on your own. Try to get a mentor or a coach that's done exactly what you want and model what works. I would suggest first going all in on their free content. And if they have some sort of coaching program or mentorship or mastermind, I've gotten so much out of this. And the reason I'm focused on this is that I was, when I got into real estate, I was really skeptical of a lot of that stuff, coaching, mastermind, all that stuff. It was because of the timing of the market. A lot of house flipping gurus had just been wiped out and their clients had been wiped out as well. But because of the way that high level content is available on the internet now, the level of sophistication of some of these coaching programs and groups has, has really offset what I'm talking about. Meaning if I'm paying 10, 25, $50,000, yes, I've paid all of those things to be with people. I want to get a ton out of the networking accountability and all that. And as someone like myself, you know, when I started down this path, I had a very low preference for time uh, and not a lot of money, meaning that I had plenty of time, no money. Now I got no time, plenty of money. So I'm trying to balance that. If you can give me a result and I have to pay you money for that, but it's not going to take my time, you can ask me all the money in the world, but you cannot ask me for my time. So you got to balance where you are as you're growing, but you guys, you can always make more money. You cannot make more time. So the faster you can come to that realization and realize that speed beats everything, the better. Yes. Couldn't agree more, you know, surrounding yourself, finding mentorship with those who have done it before, those who are where you are. And yes, you pay money. So I've paid a good amount of money. I've paid probably more than I paid for my college education, for my real estate investing education. And, news and how's flash, that going now? Newsflash, it's more lucrative than a W-2 <laughs> That's job. Right. That's right. Most jobs, at least, unless you're a you know, high-level CEO. Anyways, Hunter, I want to talk one more time. How can people learn about the 100K to Invest Summit? It's so easy because I'm a marketer, 100k2invest.com. Uh, check it out. It's a free summit and you should totally upgrade. I'll just give a quick pitch about this. It's free for 24 hours, but if you upgrade, you get lifetime access and it's all about the upgrade. You get access to all the sessions. We do VIP only sessions. You get an invitation. You can talk to people like the experts that we're going to have and the notes and the transcripts as well. So make sure that you upgrade. Yeah, that's great. And a lot of the stuff we've been talking about, it's going to go a lot deeper and the stuff is more important than ever. We've got what is it? 22 industry experts on these topics that you're going to have. Yes. And that is like across the board, retail, office, buying existing businesses, ATM machines, Bitcoin mining, senior living, you name it because I'm sponsor and asset class agnostics. So I just want to know the answer. Love it. And Hunter, if people want to follow along with what you're doing in general, is there any way they can do that? I always tell my clients, like, don't ever make this mistake. I know they want to spray and pray, but dude, it's one thing, 100k to invest.com. <laughs> Excellent. All right, Hunter, thank you so much for joining me. Ladies and gentlemen, Hunter Thompson. Thanks a lot. Thank you for listening to Freedom Investor Radio. If you like what you heard, make sure to rate, review, subscribe, and share with a friend. Thanks again for listening.